This is the One Soldier Podcast, episode 23, with me, Russell Hillier. On today's episode, I'm joined by former Rhodesian Light Infantry soldier, veteran of the Bush War, and host of the YouTube channel Fighting Men of Rhodesia, John Van Sill. John grew up in colonial Africa, a paradise, as he puts it. In the 1960s, Rhodesia was a prosperous country. One Rhodesian dollar was worth more than an American dollar. There was little crime. How quickly things fall apart, though. We're going to get into the descent into war and the destruction of that once proud country. And if you listen carefully, there are, I think, some lessons that should be learned. John joined me from his home in Cape Town, and our conversation starts now. Hi, Russell. Hey, John. How's it going? Good, thanks. Can you hear me okay? You're, you're coming in pretty well right now. Okay, I've got a, uh, I've got a proper mic here. <laughs> oh, nice. You came, you came prepared. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Sweet. <laughs> Well, John, uh, yeah, I think thanks a lot for taking the time to join the podcast. Really, uh, really happy that that I can get you to beam in all the way from Cape Town. And uh, just for fun, because it's minus uh, 30 degrees Celsius here in Calgary, just for fun, it's, I checked uh, the uh, temperature in Cape Town it's, and it's... It's over guys, 30 degrees, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are at 30 degrees. Yeah, plus. yeah, but on the plus side, I'm, I'm sweating, I just... I just had a shower and poured myself an ice cold whiskey. Oh, nice! It's, it's uh, sundowner time now here. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I could join you for that whiskey, but it's only nine <laughs> o'clock here, and my wife would uh, give me a weird look. <laughs> <block>, so. <laughs> so, so John, um, just to like, I'm just going to give the listeners like a little uh, brief genesis of, of how this this podcast sort of started. Um, I, I posted a an episode I did with Tim Bax, um, the the author of Three Sips of Gin, and then from that podcast, uh, it, it got a lot of attention. There's a clearly a huge audience for stories from Rhodesia, and uh, then like people were mentioning your uh, the work that you've been doing with Fighting Men of Rhodesia, your YouTube channel, and so we sort of connected that way. Um, and yeah, you, you've had a lot of success with that channel, haven't you? Well, it's still it's still a baby channel. I think I've got about five and a half thousand subscribers, so still a long way to go. But yeah, we have a very loyal, um, enthusiastic following amongst the uh, amongst the Rhodesians, certainly. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I'm really I feel really blessed that the channel's uh, doing so well, and the people seem to be really enjoying the uh, the various uh, videos that we've been putting out. Yeah, the content. Yeah, well, you you just started it, but from what I've seen, uh, it's it's getting lots of uh, lots of hits, lots of attention. So, and and there's like there is a huge audience for for these kinds of stories, uh, mm. which is kind of, you know, being on this side of the ocean, uh, we, you know, to be honest, like most people under the age of fifty probably know nothing about the country of Rhodesia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But obviously, there's still a lot of people out there, maybe in your part of the world, who do remember. And who want to uh, to want to learn more about the history which you're providing? Yeah. So initially, um, our main offering has been has been uh, um, stories about the Rhodesian War, um, <coughs> and then we expanded, uh, uh, started a new series on on African history, the history of Africa in general, uh, unauthorized history of Africa, where we want to cover, you know we don't really have a political axe to grind so we're hoping to really just talk about the historical facts and of because often the historical facts are not reported <laughs> yeah um and uh, and you know um and now i'm thinking of starting a third series um on legendary african hunting stories and again we can go back into history to guys like 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 salu uh, but even Hannes himself was a professional hunter for many years and was gored by a buffalo, nearly died. 
and guys like Don Price were Don was uh, regarded as one of the top uh, white hunters in Africa. So I think that kind of maybe maybe will fit in as well because you know. Uh, so yeah, so those are the three. Um, but well, at that, the moment, the you you just mentioned uh, like when you mentioned hunters in Africa, like what there's nothing more iconic than the great white hunter in in Africa, and uh, that's something that even people on my side of the ocean. Uh, can recognize so that that's going to be really cool yeah. well well let, let's get into it um i was hoping that you could maybe uh you know take us through your time with the with the rhodesian light infantry um because i know that's uh that is a storied military unit um could you, <laughs> maybe, could you maybe get into like what made the rli uh a like a special fighting force or, or sort of separated it from the rest of the uh, Rhodesian forces in that war? You know, the Rhodesian war was a funny war because, because it was right in our backyard. And, and I thought I'd start with a story of something that happened to me when I was about five or six years old and then kind of lead up how, to, how I joined the army and everything. Yeah, that'd okay. be great. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, right. I I had a very interesting father. My my dad's uh, my dad was a South African farmer, who who went up to Rhodesia in his early twenties and started farming tobacco and became um, quite successful in a, a tobacco farmer. I mean, we had two light light aircraft and uh, anyway, cut a long story short. Uh, my dad was also a hunter when he was younger, shot his first lion in the Kalahari Desert at the age of 11. Um, he, fought in, he fought in World War, uh, well, he didn't fight in World War II, but he trained Spitfire pilots and Hurricane pilots in World War II. So my dad was uh, in the Air Force in World War II. Um, he got his black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, oh, sorry, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu in 1936 prior to the war. And, um, and yeah, so I had an interesting father. At the, when, when I was young, my dad lost, um, he lost all four fingers of his right hand in the drive gears of a brick machine when he was putting uh, grease in, in, in the drive gears and one of the laborers switched the machine on and it sucked his hand into the gearbox, pulled his hand out and, and, and left most of it behind. He just had a thumb. Um, went into hospital and uh, he, he had a bad time in hospital. He got gangrene um, and had several operations on his hand. And while he was in hospital, an Anglican priest came and prayed for him and visited him. And when my dad came out of hospital, somehow this priest had a profound effect on my dad's life. And my dad said to my mom, look, I'm going to give up farming and I'm going to go to theological college and I'm going to become an Anglican priest. So when I was still a child, um, my dad went for three years, left home, went to theological college in Grahamstown, uh, got his theological degree and became a priest in the Church of England and, um, and was sent to a place called St. Faith's Mission when I was, when I was about five years old. And... Um, St. Faith's Mission was about 17 kilometers outside the small Midlands town of Rasapi. And um, because my dad had agricultural qualifications and agricultural experience, he was sent to St. Faith's because a lot of those church missions were supposed to be run as commercial farms. And this one had never been a commercial success. Um, and, uh, and it so they kind of sent my dad there because they were worried that the Rhodesian government would take over the, the farm because it was basically bankrupt. Um, and they sent my dad there as a kind of a doberman to do an audit and to find out why the farm wasn't running um, commercially, you know, successfully. And um, a little bit of history of St. Faith's mission, it, um, it, it belonged, that area belonged to a guy called King Maconi, who was executed in 1896 by the BSAP company because he participated in the African rebellion 
against the, the white settlers. So it was kind of like the, the Indian problem that you, you know, yeah. that you had with the Native American, the, the, the original uh, people of America um, with the white settlers coming in. Right. It was a very kind of similar type of situation. Um, and so my dad didn't take my dad long to realize that um, that there was actually corruption taking place on the farm. Farming equipment was being sold and the money pocketed by, um, you know, even the uh, some of the priests were stealing the money and selling the cattle and pocketing the money and all this kind of thing. And I think they realized that my dad was going to be a problem. And what I'm saying is that area had a history of antagonism towards the whites and towards the white settlers, so to speak. And um, there was a, 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 a descendant of King Makoni by the name of Didymus Mutasa. And Didymus Mutasa, um, he was the the guy who was kind of running the farm when my dad arrived, he gathered together about two or 300 people and um, they came to the little thatched roof cottage where we were staying one evening, early, early in the evening, about seven o'clock in the evening when it had just got dark. And this was one of my first childhood memories. It must've been in the early 1960s. Um, and I must've been about six years old at the time. And I can remember this line of hundreds of people coming and they were all holding torches. <laughs> and they were headed up by this guy, Didymus Mutasa. And Mutasa said to my dad, he said, we've come to, we've come to burn you out. We've come to burn your house down and we've come to kill you and your family. Uh, my, my dad was standing there in his black uh, uh, cassock, you know, his black robe. Um, you know, my dad he was still, a, still a, an Afrikaans farmer, you know, so he went inside and he came out with a, with a Bruno, a 6.5 Bruno. It was a hunting rifle um, and it only had like a magazine with five rounds in, in the magazine, you know. Yeah. And he, uh, he cocked this thing and he said, okay, I have no problem with that. Um, but I just want, and he pointed the gun at Didimus Mutasa and said to him, um, I just want you to know that I'm, you know, if you guys throw one of those, if you try and burn this house down, I'm going to shoot you. And then I'm going to empty this rifle. Yeah, I've got five rounds. He said, I'm probably going to kill at least seven or eight or 10 of you because the bullet's going to go through a couple of you, you know. But I'm going to start with you, he said. You're going to be the first one to go. And I'm standing next to my dad with big eyes like this. And, uh, and there was uh, some mumbling and some grumbling and some discussion amongst the, uh, uh, the crowd of... Uh, of enthusiastic you know, guys with their torches and and slowly they turned around and walked away and <laughs> wow and we survived you know but well that, I mean, <laughs> that, that's... that was that was one of my earliest childhood memories and that that's what it was like growing up in Rhodesia it was a bit like being a settler in the in the in the in, in a Kiowa country in the in the in the west you know and uh, and being attacked by Indians you know um so yeah, it's, it's got it, that wild west feel for sure. Yeah, definitely like a frontier. There was a frontier feel to to the country. That's what I'm trying to explain. The background of that war and and the and the unit wasn't just uh, professional soldiers. You know, like maybe you go to school in New York and you join the Marines and you you know you end up in Afghanistan and then you come back to New York. Um, for us, we were fighting in our backyard. And so for us, the war started long before we joined the army. Uh, so when, when you're 12 years old and your mom's driving you to school, you know, you're looking out for landmines, you know. And, um, and so by the time you get to join the army at the age of 17, um, the war has been part of your life for many years already, you know. Yeah, like you, it so, seems to me like you're you're already in the mindset, like you're in a a siege mindset, sort of at a very young age. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, fortunately, I I had a father who who kind of was brought me up um, 
sort of hunting, shooting, and fishing kind of uh, <laughs> lifestyle. And uh, so I had good bushcraft skills, and I was very comfortable uh, with uh, firing rifles. And you know, I had, a, I had quite a good level of marksmanship before I even joined um, the army. So, and and I'd been to uh, British education system boarding schools, um, colonial boarding schools which were just as strict as the army. So for me, so for me, joining the army was not very traumatic. Going through, going through yeah. boot camp was just like, you know, I was used to that kind of, you know, sleeping in a dormitory and, yeah. and that type of thing. Easy um, transition. Yeah. But I got called up at the age of uh, 17. Um, and just before my 18th birthday, uh, I was a national serviceman and I was, um, sent to Llewellyn Barracks, where all the national servicemen were sent to. Let me just uh, wet my throat here. Yeah, good call. And um, it was a terrible place. It was a, it was a, it was an old world. Everything was from World War II. They had these like asbestos beehive huts and everything, you know, and there was no toilet paper in the toilets. And oh my word, it was terrible. And I just, I, anyway, in the first week, we had these very um, beautifully dressed soldiers from the SAS and from the RLI, the Special Air Service Regiment and the Rhodesian Light Infantry came. Uh, and um, we were assembled in, in a hall and they, they showed us um, recruiting videos and, uh, and, you know, attempted to recruit uh, guys who were interested. And I, I immediately had come to the, I'd come to the conclusion that I didn't want to be cannon fodder. I thought if they invest a lot of money in my training, <laughs> then, then I'll be more valuable to them. So, so I, I decided to sign up for the SAS and, um, and uh, I was told that I could not go on SAS selection course until I had completed a, an 18 week or four and a half month uh, RLI recruit course. And once I was badged RLI, um, I could then cross the fence at Cranbourne Barracks and do my SAS selection course. And that's pretty much how, how I started off in the RLI. Um, so I went to Cranbourne Barracks and, and immediately it was, it was completely different to, to the to the Llewellyn barrack story, we had beautiful barrack rooms and uh, and we had excellent training and uh, fantastic um, instructors and officers. And um, yeah, by the time I left training troop, I was super fit and uh, and well trained and and quite proud of my green beret and my my silver badge and um, yeah, and then I, then I went across and I managed to pass my SA selection course. And I did a, um, I did my uh, SAS training as well, you know, with all the, the demolitions and the signals and the, the clipper canoes and the Zodiac boats and all of that. Yeah. <clears throat> but a, a, a short while before our para course, I was still a recruit now, still doing training and still being shouted at. My 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 training sergeant was Daryl Watt and uh, Garth Barrett. They, <coughs> they were Captain Garth Barrett and Daryl Watt were in charge of, of training troop um, with Ian McLean. And um, the guys who had been with me in RLI were coming back from their first few bush trips and they'd started doing fire force operation. And they'd already seen quite a lot of combat, and they were they were like old soldiers. And I was, I was still a recruit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> doing yeah. doing shine parades and running up and down and shouting yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir. And um, I got so jealous of these guys who seemed they'd somehow got older and seemed more relaxed. And I, I decided I went to I went to Cap, uh, Ian McLean and I said to him, so look, I actually. I want to be RTU'd back to the RLI because I want to I want to join in the whole fire force thing. 
Yeah. And um, so uh, McLean agreed, and uh, and I was sent on a on a canteen resupply vehicle as escort on the back of this Bedford RL. And I was sent to three commander and joined 14 troop where Tim Bax was the uh, the troop uh, officer of 14 yeah, nice. troop. Awesome. And I became I became Tim Bax's uh, machine gunner because I was quite a big guy. Yeah. Nice. Great yeah. Fun. yeah good if, I, if I could tell you if I could tell you about my first my first day. In I'd love for you to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so the vehicle was being driven by Martin Hudson, whose nickname was Pudding, because uh, he, he was kind of, you know, a big yeah. guy. <laughs> and he was, in he was in charge of us. He was sort of our quartermaster. And, uh, and so Pudding was driving the canteen vehicle. And the canteen vehicle was piled high with beers and crates of beers and Cokes, covered in canvas. And I was sitting on top of these crates with my MAG. And another guy who had a, a an FNFAL, and I must have fallen asleep because it felt like somebody we we were coming down the escarpment at Mount Mount Darwin, uh, going towards Jock Darwin in the op, op, Operation Hurricane area, um, and s suddenly I was flying through the air with with beers and coke bottles going past i was flying through the air like superman you know <laughs> <clears throat> and i landed in the middle of the road um uh, amidst all this broken glass and uh i looked around and i saw that the vehicle had rolled over apparently we lost a u-bolt or something and putting lost control of the vehicle and he'd he'd rolled the vehicle and he was lying in the road i think he damaged his shoulder and uh, I didn't. I thought we'd hit a landmine because I'd I'd been asleep. You know, I just right. woke up and I was so I I was convinced we'd hit a landmine. And uh, and I couldn't find my my weapon anywhere. Um, so so I went up to this other guy who had his weapon, and I, I said, Excuse, I, I grabbed the weapon and pulled it away from him and said, I love that. Thanks very much. And I stood in the middle of the road like Audie Murphy, sort of waiting for the war to begin. Uh, which it didn't, and uh, and the next thing, a, a, a three commando vehicle came over the hill with with the log insulin, fourteen troop sergeant uh, in charge, and log stopped his vehicle, and there was a period of silence where they looked at me standing in the middle of the road, and uh, they didn't acknowledge me at all, and he told everyone to debus, and all the guys silently went straight into the bush and started opening beers you know <laughs> and they started drink, drinking as many of the beers as they possibly could in as short, short a time as possible anyway so yeah i got a lift back to jock darwin with them and when i when i oh the other thing that interested me was as we were just before we got into the operational area i remember passing a big tree with a citron a vehicle on top of this tree and it apparently been blown there by a landmine wow. and when you when you pass that vehicle it was it was a sign that you were entering in the operational area and i remember the guy saying okay switch on now you're getting into the you know into the operational area yeah now now you know you're <laughs> getting into it yeah yeah and uh so i arrived at it's now early evening and i arrived at uh at jock uh, at jock Darwin and got introduced to the guys at 14 Troop. And, and two of them, everyone was gathered around and they were looking at a map. And um, this one guy showed me the map and he, it, had, it had two bullet holes in it. Apparently that evening, um, a helicopter had been sent to pick these guys up. And because it was getting dark, the chopper pilot couldn't see where they were. So he said, wave your map. So he, he put his map up in the air and waved his map at, and a group put two, two bullets through the map. Through wow. the map. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is so awesome. This is my first day in the bush, you know, and it's my first experience of three commander. Yeah. You, so your first I, day, your first day is you, you've got beer and uh, bullets yeah, fly. Yeah. 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 It was a, 
it was a huge 3D adventure, I must say. I loved every minute of it, yeah. But, so when, when you're in that area, my, my understanding is that there was like different terrorist groups that you guys were fighting. Like there was the uh, like the terrorist groups based out of Mozambique and then from Zambia uh, as well, I think. Um, it, like was, was there different terrorist groups that you're up against or like- yes. uh, <clears throat> In the Operation Hurricane area, we were mainly fighting against Mugabe's crowd. Um, actually, I don't know if I mentioned earlier on that Didymus Mutasa, that guy who came to burn our house down, right, became the speaker of parliament or, or became the speaker of the Zimbabwean National Assembly from 1980 to 1990. He was uh, also on on the ZANU or the Zanla uh, Politburo and was one of Mugabe's right hand men. Anyway, that same right. guy who came to burn our house down. Um, yeah, so we were fighting mainly the Zimbabwean African Nationalist Liberation Army, who were sponsored by the Chinese, um, and uh, <clears throat> they had all of their equipment was Chinese kits, and a lot of them used to have um, the little red book of Thoughts of Mao with them. Oh, really? And, uh, and they had their political commissars, and yeah, they were real communists. And... Um, and uh, their method of fighting was very much, I would say, terrorist in the sense that they tended to avoid contact with the security forces and rather go for <coughs> civilian targets, soft targets, uh, farmers, uh, civilian stores, and all of that type of thing. And the main problem we had was finding them Whereas the Zipra forces, uh, Zimbabwean People's Revolutionary Army, were financed by Russia and, and came out of Zambia. And they were much better trained, uh, I would say professional soldiers, rather than kind of terrorists, if you know what I mean, yeah. like the difference between a, between a professional soldier. And they didn't shy away from from contact with the Rhodesian military. Um, and so there were, there were two kind of different, um, there were definitely two, two different, very different types of armies with, with but, and, and they were also enemies of each other. So, I, I was gonna ask that, like I was wondering if, if they would uh, like coordinate with each other or, or not. Uh, they did form an alliance called, later on they formed an alliance called the Patriotic Front. <clears throat> but when they met each other in the bush, they used to shoot it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the first thing Mugabe did, because the Zebra guys were mainly uh, Matabili, and the Zanla guys were mainly Shona. So there was also a tribal, tribal difference there. And um, you must understand in Rhodesia, the Matabili invaded Rhodesia or invaded what was called Zambesia, before it was called Rhodesia, uh, back in the day. And the, there was a, a Zulu king in South Africa who had gone a bit crazy and uh, he was killing his own men. He would order his own MPs to march off a cliff to test their loyalty. And these guys wow. would march off the cliff to their deaths just to test their loyalty, you know, kind of thing. So, crazy. One of his main indunas, uh, um, by the name of Mzilakatsi, like one of his generals, took took his whole army and left, and went north and went into Zambezia and uh, found. Uh, you remember the Zulus were a very warlike, um, a very warlike nation, and yeah. um, and they made their their living kind of. Um, Killing and pillaging other tribes, and um, and and taking their women and uh, and children and enslaving them, and so um, so the in fact, yeah, in fact, uh, amongst the, the the Matabili, they they were not allowed to get married. They were not allowed to uh, 
have a woman until they had washed their spear in blood. So their initiation rite was every spring they would go on a killing party and, and wash their spears in blood. And then when they got back, they were, you know, they were now men and they were allowed to, you know. Get yeah. So that, that's like the, the initiation right yeah. in the Yeah, just just like the Maasai have to go kill a lion, you know. Um, yeah. The Matabili had to go kill a Shona. So the first thing Mugabe did when he took over was he organized the Bukura Hundi, which is the Shona word for the wind that sweeps everything away. And he organized the Bukura Hundi massacre where he, where he massacred tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, Matabili people, rounding up villages, putting them into cattle trucks like Hitler did with the Jews. And, um, whole villages marched marched them down empty mine shafts and that type of thing yeah and when, when was that done like what what year would that, that be that would have been in the early uh nine uh sorry that would have been in the early 80s i'm yes. not a historian so don't ask me history yeah no no but like after after he assumed the the presidency though of, of yeah Zimbabwe. yeah that Zimbabwe. was that was the first thing on his agenda that was one of the first things he did and, and there's a great there's a book called Makiwa, uh, written by Peter Godwin, um, which covers the story of the Gokura Hundi. Um, but you can, you can, anyone can Google it. It's on Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, Gokura Hundi, yeah, G U K. Um, but it just goes and, to show uh, the, the animosity between the two groups, though. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and yeah. So because ZANU PF run the country. Uh, to a large extent, the Matabili are disenfranchised in Zimbabwe. And so I'm here in Cape Town. The, most of the black Zimbabweans here in Cape Town are, are Matabili from, you know, who would have been Zipra right. uh, during the war. Um, and uh, there's no future for them with the Shonas in charge. So tribalism is also another thing in Africa that you have to consider. Yeah, it adds a new dimension to uh, the warfare, I'm sure, that's going on. Uh, yeah. Time. Sorry, I, I probably haven't answered your original question. About <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's great, man. It's uh, some some good history, but yeah, like I, my my understanding is that uh, well, Rhodesia was in a tough, I guess you could say, strategic situation, especially when the Portuguese pulled out of Mozambique, uh, because, or sorry, uh, yeah, I think I have that right. But anyways, the Portuguese left their colony. And then yeah. that sort of opened up the, uh, it sort of opened up that country for the terrorists to, to move sort of in the open and, you know, with impunity. And then, so you, you guys were basically surrounded. I mean, you had South Africa um, uh, as an ally, but then, and this is interesting too, and maybe you can get into this, but uh, South Africa helped out Rhodesia for quite some time, but then the, the Western nations sort of, leaned on south africa pretty hard to you know cut yeah. the supplies and, and all that stuff and and yeah. to me like my my very basic understanding of the war is that that really sort of put the uh, the nail in the coffin if you will yeah look uh, my partner hannes vessels is a is a, a keen historian um and uh, hannes is probably more qualified to answer those kind of uh, political and, and historical type of questions than I am. Um, uh, I've never really had an interest in politics, but I've always had a keen interest in, in, in military history. Yeah. Um, but from a soldier's perspective, not from a sort of a geopolitical perspective. Um, but yeah, look, we were, we were pretty surrounded. Uh, even, even before the uh, Portuguese left, Mozambique, uh, they had already, for years before that, they had lost control of the country to Frelimo. And um, so, uh, since, ever since I kind of became a teenager, I, I can remember, um, you know, terrorists coming in, uh, crossing the border, the Mozambican border. The very first uh, terrorists came from Zambia. Um, I was very good friends with Trevor Des Fountain, uh, and so was Tim Bax, also friends with Trevor. Um, 
Trevor was the young subaltern who was in charge of the, the stick of men that in the very first contact of the Rhodesian War. Um, and Trevor is one of the reasons why I started this whole series because Trevor had so many fantastic stories. And unfortunately he died and all of those stories went with him. But Trevor, and I still have the original contact report and the original maps handwritten um i have this these hand-drawn maps trevor gave me this packet of documents and that was a a full sit trip uh of 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 the first contact of the rhodesian war wow <clears throat> and that was against zipra that was against zipra guys in on the zambezi river so the first the first lot of contact was against zipra on the zambezi river guys coming in over from zambia but as the war hotted up, uh, Zandla became more and more of a problem um, because their method of operation was to infiltrate the villages, similar to the VC in Vietnam, where, where you would go into a village and you would, have no, you would have no idea of who was a civilian and who was a combatant because at nighttime, the guy would, would lift some straw and pick up his AK and put on his you know, black pajamas and, and he was now a VC, you know? Yeah, right. And, uh, and during the day, he was just an innocent farmer, you know? So um, I think Mao, you know, the whole Mao's whole philosophy of, of fishes, um, you know, swimming in the, in the sea, that they must be like that. And so for us, it was one of the main difficulties was finding them to kill them. Killing them wasn't the problem. It was finding them was the problem. And I joined the war in 1974. And I can remember my barrack room at Jock Darwin was right opposite this corrugated iron enclosure, which was the brand new Salu Scouts fort. And the Salu Scouts made a huge difference to the war because they had a way now of finding uh, the terrorists. And so to a large degree, the war that I was involved in in the mid 70s <clears throat> was a war where the Salu Scouts would find the terrorist camps um, and they would send in a fire force uh, manned by the RLI and the RLI would take them out. And, and so in a way, we were we were just like a weapon that was aimed and fired every yeah. time they, they found. So, so sorry, I'm, if I'm rambling. Well, no, no, it's yeah. it's uh, when you say that they were the the terrorists were hard to find. It it reminds me of what Tim Bax said about uh, he had this uh, saying that to find a snake, you have to become a snake. Yeah, and, exactly. and so he was sort of using that as an analogy about. Well, to find a terrorist, you got to you got to sort of pretend that you're a terrorist as well, and so that yeah. and that led to you know all, all these crazy uh, infiltration missions where they're they're putting on black face paint and trying to like actually fit in with the or or at least disguise themselves from the local population uh, yeah. and get right in there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, they would actually send in um, they would actually send in guys who had formerly been. Um, in Zanla or Zipra and um, black black soldiers and who could speak the language and you know pass themselves off as look we knew in the area and we're looking for the local the local boys we where, where's the local chapter of our of our group you know and they'd say well the next village you'll find them there and in that valley over there they've got a camp in you know in that ravine. And, and then they'd go and they'd check out the ravine and they'd say, yep, there's 30 guys camped in that ravine. And then they'd get on the radio and call the RLI and call in an airstrike and, you know, and we'd go in and sort it, sort it out. So that was kind of how it happened for me. Um, in 14 Troop uh, with Tim Bax, we were, we were about, at the time, we were under strength. So there were about 12 of us, which meant we were three, we were three sticks of four men. <clears throat> three for Alpha was our call sign, three for three commander, 
Paul for 14 troop, Alpha for, for Alpha Stick, led by Tim Bax. And then there would be three for Bravo and three for Charlie. And uh, most of the time I was in three for Alpha with, with Tim. Um, and we would, we would hang around um, in these, uh, we would hang around at base and there would be a bunch of helicopters parked on a football field next to our base. And then when the siren went, um, Tim would run to the ops room and he would get a briefing and, and get the relevant maps. And we would run, we would grab our kit and run for the chopper, depending on whether you were first wave, second wave, or, th or, 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 or sorry, you, one day you first wave, one day you second wave, and one day you had off. In those days, when the war hotted up later, they, that whole system changed. But in, yeah. in our day, you had every third day off. <laughs> yeah. Although if you were first wave, you had a very good chance of actually being in combat. So sometimes twice a day, or even three times a day, if you were first wave. If you were second wave, you would only go into combat if first wave had already been dropped somewhere and there was another call out. Then the choppers would come back and pick up second wave and they would go to that call out. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so usually if you were first wave, you saw some combat. Well, you, um, you guys must have seen it. It almost seems like uh, you saw a lot of combat because like you're, you're, if you have like every third day off, but it, in those first two days, like you're, you're flying out there, you're, you're on missions. Like there's, there's a lot of action going on. It seems. What there wasn't that much action going on when I was in the army, but what action there was, was dealt with by the ROI. Uh, right. fire force. Yeah. So whatever action was there, pretty much most of it was dealt with by us. Uh, you must remember that we had a system in, in the Rhodesian army of, um, the RLI and, and the Territorial Army uh, used to, they pretty much covered the whole operational area with, with observation with OPs on top of, of any, any mountain creature. There would, there would be preferably a clandestine a team of, of guys um, on top of the mountain with binoculars watching watching the visible area beneath them and any suspicious movement uh, would be reported on the radio and assessed and if it was deemed um, um, good intel they would they would send in a fire force um, so for example if you saw a group of women carrying a large amount of of, of food on you know mm -hmm. uh, on the radio basis that every morning these five women go in with a whole lot of food into this ravine and then they come out without the food and then at lunchtime they go in with more food and come back you know yeah. and then it doesn't take you long to figure out okay there's you know they're feeding people in this ravine and uh and then you you know call in an airstrike into that ravine you know and um so um uh, yeah. And, and John, uh, how, how did, uh, what, one thing that I was curious about is, uh, you, you'd have, uh, the black soldiers sort of infiltrating the, the enemy areas, finding out where they are, but like, how, how did you, how would you turn those guys? Because, uh, like often they would be former enemy combatants. Uh, like wh what do you do to persuade them or, or convince them that like, Hey, you should switch sides and, and, uh, and help us out. Like that, that seems like a really tall order. I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question because I was never in the Sulu Scouts, but uh, Tim would have been able to answer that question. Yeah. What I, can, what I can tell from what I've heard and being mates with a lot of the, the Scouts guys um, is that they try to turn the guys immediately, almost on day one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they would... <clears throat> First of all, treat them very well, offer them protection uh, for their families. They would be able to move their families onto a military base um, and, and immediately introduce them to their former combatants who are now Salute Scouts. And apparently nine times out of 10, these guys would jump at the chance of switching sides. Yeah. 
Um, so, <clears throat> which, I, seem, which um, seems kind of strange because uh, you know they're they're apparently fighting this war of liberation or or whatever you want to call it, and then you know they're they're willing to to switch sides. I mean, it, just, it just seems kind of strange from an outsider looking into it. I know, I know. You know, my take on it. Uh, bearing in mind, I was a Rhodesian. <clears throat> brought up in Rhodesia. I went to a multiracial school. We didn't really have apartheid or anything like that in Rhodesia. So we didn't have that kind of petty um, racial laws that South Africa had. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when I was at school, we had, you know, I slept next to a black guy in my dormitory and I had a, an Indian guy on the other side of me from uh, India. And so, you know, my parents were very kind of liberal, left-wing kind of um, people. Um, so I was not brought up in a kind of a redneck right-wing family or anything. I was brought up quite open-minded. And uh, to me, it seemed as though the, the indigenous Africans were just caught in the middle. They were caught in the middle. And yeah. On the one hand, you had these um, terrorists who were, were indoctrinated. Uh, and I don't, I don't doubt that they believed strongly in the liberation, et cetera. But, but they were trained along classical Chinese communist methods of that the first thing you do is you politicize the local population. Yeah, and so they used to have these big meetings at night called pungwis, where where they would teach the people political slogans and try and educate them, try and politicize them basically because these people were just rural farmers. They had no yeah. political axe to grind at all, and often these guys would 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 open the conversation by calling the village headman. Um, they would take the village headman sorry I'm, i don't know how graphic one can be on this uh, you, you can go as, as deep as you want into it okay you can always you can always edit it out right yeah they they'd cut off his uh, they'd cut off his lips and his nose and his ears and then um um rape his wife in front of him and then make his wife cook and eat her husband's nose and ears Oof. And then bayonet him a hundred times in front of all the people. And then say to the village, who now have been gathered around and are forced to watch all this happening, the, the village headman's wife being raped and the village headman being bayoneted to death. And then say, okay, we just want to show you guys that we mean business. And we want you to provide us with food. We want you to provide us with beer. We want you to supply us with women. And you have to look after us and you have to hide us. And if any of you report us to the security forces, we will put you inside your hut with your family and we will burn your hut, we'll burn you alive. And kind of, so the villagers are now terrified. They were, they were way more terrified of us than, I mean, of the terrorists than they were of us. Right. Because, because we didn't used to do that kind of thing, you know. So we'd come in and we'd ask for information and yeah, we could be quite... Um, we could be quite bossy and, you know, uh, uh, shove them around and, you know, and try and intimidate them. But they, they were not scared of us because they knew that we were not that barbaric and brutal. And so, you know, I just looked at them with compassion and I thought how terrible it must be to be in their place because there's this war taking place and they're kind of caught in the middle. They have to feed and harbor and hide the the uh, gorillas and then they have to deal with us coming looking for the gorillas and 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 kind of um interrogating them and you know yeah yeah so it, it, they were between a rock and a hard place and uh <coughs> i yeah it's uh it's sort of like a a cautionary tale because uh the the communists like first of all they they completely like they terrorize that village they go in if if they go into that village and kill the chief rape his wife uh you know and just like act like complete savages and of course they're going to just scare the shit out of those people yeah and then once you have that 
foundation of fear, then then you can sort of propagandize them and, and take it from there. I mean, you remember that movie Apocalypse Now where Colonel Kurtz talks about the diamond. Yeah. How they, the American guys went in trying to win hearts and minds and they inoculated all the children against smallpox or something. Yeah. And the next day they came back to the village and there was this big pile of little arms where the VC had cut off every single kid's arm that had been inoculated. Yeah. And it was yeah. like saying, now that is, that's just brilliant. That's just like yeah. a diamond bullet, you know, because <laughs> you can't, you can't beat that. How do you beat that? No. You, know, you, can't, you can't beat that. You know what I mean? No, there's no, like, yeah, like, unless you, yeah, there's just, there's no way. It's just, it's, it's too, that's a level of brutality that I think people, uh, I don't know. It seems like maybe just, maybe that's a characteristic of war in Africa, just like very brutal and. Yeah. Look, I must say, I, I did see a lot of uh, atrocities, uh, but not, not on our side, to be honest. Um, but I came across, you know, villages where, where the whole village had been herded into a big uh, grass hut and the grass hut had been burned and all these burned bodies and things like that. So it was, it wasn't pleasant, but um, I'm proud to say in the RLI, I never heard of a single rape or uh, I think there were cases of, particularly if we were out of the country in Mozambique, of getting souvenirs, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you found a Tokri of pistol or you found an AK uh, bayonet or, or, you know, you found a, a pile of cash, you know, you'd stuff that into your, into your pocket um, or a nice Rolex watch or something like that. Um, the guys used to, used to like souvenir hunting, but I never... Um, heard of or came across a, a case of of Rhodesian soldiers raping the local woman or anything like that so and, I, and I'm not I'm, I'm speaking openly and honestly now mm -hmm. you know 40 years later um, I, I didn't do anything I'm ashamed of and when I look at myself in the mirror I sleep well at night you know feeling a sense of of pride actually of, of what we accomplished uh, there even though yeah. in the end it was all for nothing. Well, and, and that's that's an interesting point. Is that uh, you guys? I mean, you sort of alluded to this before, but you said the war was in your backyard, and so um, you know, when if if Canada or America is fighting a war overseas in Afghanistan, well, you can lose the war, and but you're still going to have your home. You're still going to have your country. With you guys, yeah. it, it's it's one of those things where if you lose the war, then you lose everything like you, you lose your home you lose yeah, your country exactly. um and so it's it's like an existential battle where there there's a lot at stake absolutely yeah that's that, that exactly. must have, that must have driven you guys and to like that must have been like one of the factors that kind of kept your morale up i guess yeah look um um Russell, yeah, we were definitely in the end the whole the whole country was at war. Uh, every Rhodesian knew somebody who had been killed. Um, you know, in my little town where I grew up in Chapinga, there were oh, so many. You know, people, farmers, uh, their children um, who were killed. Um, my girlfriend. At the time, when I was in the Rhodesian Light Infantry, I had a girlfriend, Sharon Ridley, and uh, both her parents were killed in the centenary area. Um, they went out shopping for groceries, and they came back from shopping for groceries. And uh, when they stopped at the farm gate, um, you know, AKs and RPGs and yeah. RPG-7s, and I mean, they weren't even armed, I don't think. And uh, so, you know, my own girlfriend lost both her parents and um, that was, you know, so we all, we all, it was that kind of war. It was like a civil, like, I guess the American Civil War was yeah. a bit like that in a way. Yeah, well, it's yeah. just sort of like a place, well, there's no safe place, really. No. In that kind no. of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that what, uh, 
like by by the end of things like with i mean you're you win all you you win the firefights i mean when you when you go out into the field i mean it seems like the the outcome of any firefight was never really in doubt but uh mm-hmm. with so many with so much destruction back home uh is is that what by the end of it were people no, just ready never to sort that. of like like it wasn't worth it anymore like the, the cost was too high i mean right up until the end we were we were prepared to fight we were prepared to if necessary you know do a coup um yeah there was never uh, there were a lot of Rhodesians who left the country um and um but but for those who stayed, they were they were prepared to fight to the bitter end, and uh, because for many of us, we we had nowhere else to go. Um, yeah, you know, just it was like uh, there was there was nowhere else to go, and it was it was strange. I mean, I can remember, and I don't ask me for dates, but you can you can Google. That's a nice thing about about google is that anybody says anything you can always check it immediately. oh yeah <laughs> um but but the terrorists planted a bomb in woolworths in salisbury which is a big supermarket um and i remember it was a big bomb it was a in a suitcase i think it was something like 22 kilos of plastic oh, explosive, yeah. and that they left at the baggage counter uh at woolworths and I can just remember I was near, I was a couple of blocks away from Woolworths when I was walking on the pavement and suddenly it's, it's as if everything just went silent. Like the birds stopped singing and it's almost as if the air stopped blowing. Yeah. And then suddenly there was this shock wave you know, that just kind of hit me. So you were there. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was like two blocks away. And um, I remember seeing this black woman come running past me screaming and she she had this huge piece of glass sticking out of her neck wow. which was spraying blood you know and then i ran towards where the explosion was and there was a a, a river of blood that kind of went about 150 meters down the middle of the road and formed a big pool i, I only i think only about 22 people were killed but um they were scraping them off the walls with teaspoons jeez but you know that kind of thing um you never know when you sit down in a pub or go to a restaurant where it's going to blow up, you know? Yeah. It, it's difficult. It must have been like that for people in London during the, with the IRA. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people yeah. have been through that kind of thing. Or, or even, uh, or even like the, uh, like the world war two blitz maybe where like there could yeah. be a bomb falling on you at any time. Yeah. Yeah. So even though you're not in the army, you're still in the war. Yeah. And, uh, and I think everybody, you know, if to, if to go from one town to another town, you had to uh, go in convoy. Yeah. So you had to wait outside the town, like at a at at, at the one kilometer, you know, layby, and wait for enough cars to form a, a convoy, and then the police would be a vehicle in front and a vehicle at the back, and both vehicles would have a. They would be like, what do you call them? Technicals, like a, yeah, right, you know, with a yeah. Browning or something mounted on the back of a of a ute and uh, and uh, you'd kind of go together because you know if you went on your own you'd probably be ambushed and yeah. so so the war really did affect everybody every Rhodesian or certainly white Rhodesian housewife was issued with a Israeli uh, Uzi oh really and every man was issued with a FAL an FNFAL and yeah. um, so it's quite common you go do your grocery shopping all the women have got a machine that a submachine gun in the, in the trolley. You know? <laughs> yeah, that'd be quite a sight. Yeah, yeah. It, it felt, you know, you talk about the Blitz, it felt for me the same spirit. Hitler thought by bombing London that he would break the spirit of the Londoners, you know? Yeah. But if, if anything, he actually forged, uh, forged their spirits stronger into a sense of community and and there was that wonderful, there was a wonderful spirit that I felt that must have been something like, you know, the spirit that they had in World War Two. you know. Um, yeah, felt, just that camaraderie and like you're all in it, yeah. like with each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what, one of the, uh, one of the themes of the podcast, John, is like we, we talk to like authors and people who have lived these experiences about how 
you know, how quickly things fall apart. And uh, it's kind of crazy to think about how, you know, in Rhodesia, it started off with like a few like isolated farm attacks uh, in remote areas. And then uh, as time goes on, it just sort of snowballs into like this uh, picture that you're so vividly painting right now of uh, where no, no corner of the country is really safe. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, but, but things do fall apart quickly because I, I would imagine if you were in Rhodesia sometime in the 1960s and you were to say to somebody, oh, with, within like 15 years, this country is not even going to exist anymore. They, they might've said, oh, you're crazy. Uh, these like, these like little farm attacks, like it's not, it's, you know, it's not going to change much, but, uh, but then all of a sudden, you know, fast forward a 10 years and it's a completely different game and the country's gone. It's just kind of crazy to think about how, how fast things do fall apart. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing to lose your country. Um, you know, you sitting there with a Canadian flag hanging behind you. And I've no doubt that on, on various occasions, you salute that flag with tremendous pride. And we felt pride in our flag. And it's hard. It's hard to lose your country, to lose your flag, to lose your national anthem to lose your identity. I, <clears throat> I do not, even though I was born in that country and raised in that country, I don't qualify for a passport right. for that country. Even though I was a citizen of that country because I'm the wrong color. Mm -hmm. So because I'm white, uh, I don't qualify for a Zimbabwean passport. Fortunately, South Africa gave me, gave me citizenship because my parents were South Africans, but um, I should qualify for a UK citizenship. I mean, I, I wore the Queen's crown, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> in the armed forces. Um, and uh, so much of uh, like, so much of our identity is based upon like where, where we grew up and, you know, where our families are from. But can you even go back to, to Zimbabwe today and, and sort of, you know, could you go back and see your childhood home or. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I could go as a tourist if it, if, if it wasn't for the COVID uh, right. restrictions, uh, travel restrictions, uh, I could go back as a tourist. Yeah. But I bet it would just be totally, you, you wouldn't recognize it, I'm sure. I think I would. Uh, the small towns haven't changed that much. I don't think okay. probably a lot more, a lot more potholes in the road. And, you know, most, they, I'm told that they don't, you know, they don't have electricity for most of the day. And, you know, so um, it's a lot more dysfunctional. I, I actually grew up in a, I'm, I'm really, really, I feel a sense of great joy that I would probably the last generation to grow up in colonial Africa. Mm -hmm. And a, as a British colony, it was beautiful, man. It was a beautiful country. It was beautifully run. There was before the war happened. There was no crime. It was prosperous. It was, it was, it was like growing up in paradise. Really, I, I can't tell you how fantastic it was. And one Rhodesian dollar was worth more than one U.S. dollar. Yeah, I had heard that. And later on. Uh, Ten billion dollars couldn't buy a loaf of bread. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, we, we've all we've all seen that uh, famous Zimbabwean <laughs> like one trillion dollar banknote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's hard to describe that I that I feel like a stateless person because I don't I don't feel South African and I don't feel loyal to South Africa. South Africa is not really my country. Yeah, I I'm grateful to to South Africa for giving me citizenship. Uh, but I have no um, emotional loyalty to this government or to this country or to this flag. And I, um, I just feel like my loyalty is to my fellow Rhodesian, to my brothers in arms. Primarily, I'm very active in, in our regimental association and we meet at least once a month yeah uh if not more often um we on a whatsapp group and we talk to each other every single day we 
say good morning to each other. <laughs> yeah, nice. So, you know, if you've been a soldier, you know, especially if you've been a soldier in combat, you know the the friendships and brotherhood, the friendships and the, the relationships that you form in the army are often stronger than family. And, and it's those friendships that we formed there that are my new, if you like, my new family. I have no other family in Africa. Both my parents are dead. I have a brother who lives in Los Angeles, uh, an older brother, um, and we sometimes talk on, on Skype. Um, I have a son and uh, my youngest son's in Australia and my oldest son's in London. So yeah, my only family here in South Africa is my fellow RLI buddies, you know, and yeah, guys yeah. from, from the SAS and the Scouts and we gather together on a regular basis and uh, it's a very real friendship and uh, we support each other. And that's kind of our, yeah, I don't know. I don't I, know I think... making any sense. <laughs> Well, no, it, it does make a lot of sense uh, because when, you know, when, when you are sort of like, uh, you know, when you're somebody in your, in your situation, like you, you, you want to, you want to be able to like be a part of a community and, yeah. and, and that is your community. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Russell. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting to me as a Canadian uh, to think about and, and maybe like, well, I think we'll probably end this off like fairly soon, but uh, you know, my children are growing up in uh, what I would call a paradise. It's, it's a, it's a modern first world country, hardly any crime. Uh, life is good. Life is pretty yeah. good. But if, if you look at the world and the history of the world and the history of Rhodesia, it's a, it's really a cautionary tale that uh, just because things are, are the way they are now uh well it doesn't mean they're going to be like that forever and i think i think there's like almost a, a duty to sort of educate yourself uh, about that and, and just be aware of what's going on in the world and how things can change i think it's incumbent on every citizen to to protect what they regard as precious you know um in whatever way they can whether it's through the ballot box or mm -hmm. Um, or service you know, yeah or service in some way um but to to protect and preserve uh a way of life that is decent and um you know i don't know it's hard it's hard to describe all i can tell you is that life is not great in zimbabwe right now you know and they they got their political freedom but they it hasn't it hasn't resulted in in any improvement in their in fact the exact opposite so if yeah. i could maybe end with this statistic um uh when ian smith handed the country over to mugabe uh, there was a a 96 percent employment rate so 96% of the people in the country had jobs. And now Zimbabwe has a 96% unemployment rate. Only 4% of Zimbabweans have jobs. Yeah. If you can imagine that. I can't. What it's like. <laughs> that, that's yeah. just, that's, that's, that's a failed state right there. Yeah. yeah. No so that, that's that. an interesting statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, think I mean, so I mean, whatever you have to say about colonialism, let me tell you, there's a whole bunch of, of black guys in Zimbabwe my age who, who look back on the colonial days as the good old golden days when life was good. You know? yeah. They look at it now with their, you know, with their grandchildren's empty bellies and they think, wow, you know. Life, so life's gotten worse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and you, you got to, I mean, you got to hand it to the British. I mean, they in terms of like running colonies, they, nobody really did it better than them. I mean, they, yeah, they actually, yeah. Uh, you know, went about building the infrastructure and, and tr at least trying to leave like a, a functional government when, when they left. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, first of all, before we go, uh, this has been a really good discussion. I, I think there's just so many words of wisdom uh, that, that you have and that, that you can impart to an audience. So, uh, thanks a lot for, 
for taking the time to be here. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, ho- hopefully, who knows, maybe uh, maybe you could do an episode on, on your unauthorized history of Africa, do an episode on, on the Boer War, because I know there's a big Canadian connection to that. Yes. I think you should get Hannes uh, Vestwald to, to do a podcast. Um, Hannes is um, he's a real... He's a real, he's, yeah, he's got a lot more uh, uh, interesting, you know, he's a historian and he knows a lot more about the history of Africa than I do. Um, But I'm always happy. I didn't really answer your questions about the RLI, uh, I feel. No, I I think we we got into it a little bit. I mean, I I think we could um, probably spend another two hours on this easily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if uh, maybe, maybe one day we can do, we can do one that's aimed at soldiers going into combat. I often thought I would have loved to have um, spent time training uh, training guys um, uh, to go into combat. Um, you know, just just practical stuff that I learned how to, how to stay alive and yeah. uh, and how almost every time somebody got wounded or killed, unless it was like they were in a chopper that was shot down or something, a lot of times guys got wounded or killed because they made a mistake in terms yeah. of their of their soldiering you know um and definitely if you if you if you if you stuck to the rules you had a much better chance of survival than if you you know broke the rules and uh but uh but that yeah that's for another day but thank you so much for maybe, the maybe that will be uh, yeah maybe that'll be part two <laughs> so no, so but, uh, I think I think definitely try and get Hannes. I'm happy to introduce you to him. Um, he's busy traveling from Kenya back to South Africa at the moment, but I'm sure in a, in a couple of weeks' time he'll be he'll be free and uh, and he's he's well worth he's well worth getting. Yeah. Yeah. If well, maybe I, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll be in touch with you afterwards and maybe, yeah, uh, make that introduction. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Thanks, Russell. Thanks very much, man. And that concludes my discussion with John Van Sill, veteran of the Rhodesian Bush War and the host of the YouTube channel, Fighting Men of Rhodesia. If you want more fascinating stories from that country, then do yourself a favor and take a look at John's channel. I'm going to post a link to it on the website. But I think it's a cautionary tale, the story, the history, the downfall of Rhodesia. And you can say that colonialism was bad and all the relics of that system deserved to fall. And maybe it was inevitable. And maybe it's a valid point. But the lesson for us all, no matter where you call home, is that history moves slowly for 99% of the time. But we're only ever one event, one catalyst away from things falling apart. And it happens quickly. And that is the lesson of history. Don't get too comfortable or complacent. Don't take things for granted in your country. Prepare yourself. Lest Rhodesia repeats itself in your backyard. Guys, if you like today's podcast, then you can help me out in a couple ways. First, you can like and share and subscribe or follow the podcast. You can leave a comment. By the way, I do try to respond to everybody who does. Tell your friends and family as well to check out what we're doing here. And speaking of which, this is a good time to say thanks to the new members of the One Soldier podcast. And I'm talking to you, Adam, Les, GC Mountain Man, Chris, Oildale, to name just a few. Gentlemen, thank you for your support. Hey, you can also support the podcast by checking out one of my two books, The Best Selling One Soldier, A Canadian Soldier's Fight Against the Islamic State, and The Pawns of War. Finally, I'm going to dedicate this episode to all the veterans of the Rhodesian Light Infantry and the veterans of that most brutal Bush War. That's it for today. Out.